welcome to all of you on behalf of the Raza Foundation and the India International Center who collaborate to organize this almost monthly panel discussion called Art Matters. What is which, which is this? 20th. 20th. So this is 20th. So we have been there 20 months, if you like. Uh, that's a long innings for a series of panel discussions on issues which impinge upon the various arts and literature in our time. We have had uh, discussions on democracy and culture, the disappearing criticism, art in public space, changing languages, arts and the media, public institutions and art, imagining our time, classical in our time, we and they, why arts stop talking to each other, arts and audience, coping with the unknown, and urban chaos and the arts. And this evening, we have three distinguished panelists to discuss art, criticism, and market. Somebody told me the other day, and that's how the theme appeared to me, that criticism has become unnecessary because market has taken over. And it is market which makes reputations and mass or soils or whatever uh, raises reputations, that artistic reputations are now made. In any case, art reviews, etc., have disappeared from the newspapers. And what appears is the news about such and such painting has fetched such and such price in such and such auction. So that is one part. So has criticism, as it is, most crit art criticism in this country is funded by the art galleries. It is published. Uh, as catalogues and, and, and catalogues and essays. There are a few others, of course, not, not entirely, but a large part. And uh, on the other hand, it may be argued that after all, the reputations are made by critical appreciation. That they cannot entirely be made. People do want to understand what they are seeing. They want to appreciate what they are buying. And therefore, criticism is a necessary help. There was once a seminar, I think, in Germany, which was called Markets of Criticism. And Robert Starr and people like that participated in that. I had bought that book. Today I was looking in my godown. Call it a library will be uh, entirely uh, inappropriate because it's a bit of a godown in which all kinds of things was... I couldn't lay my hands on that book. But be that as it may, You can argue that in literature also market matters. There are bestsellers and there are talks about um, and they're pushing out uh, the usual thing. So here is a, but it is more evident, more visible perhaps in the world of visual arts. So we have here Peter Nagy who has been running and supporting a lot of innovative art for a long while. Uh, and has also been uh, responsible for one of the persons responsible, uh, at least, for the international projection of Indian art. We have Gayatri Sinha, who is uh, a well-known art critic, who has been looking at art critically uh, for a long time. And we have Arun Badera, who runs one of the most prestigious art galleries, the Badera Art Gallery on whose list some of the most important moderns happen to be. So we have these three people. The rules of the game are simple, but strict. One, that each of them will make a presentation of 15 minutes or so, because there will be three of them, so they may even exceed it by a few minutes. And 
after they have all the three have made their presentation, there will be time for them to discuss it between themselves. Should they need any clarification or elaboration or want to make comment on what the other panelists might have said. And then it will be open to house, to you, to make again brief comments on what is being said. Or if you have some remarkably untouched point to make it very briefly. <coughs> Uh, brevity remains in the entire uh, sort of exercise, uh, not only the soul of the bit, but also a necessary condition. Uh, this is a reasonably intelligent audience, therefore we should assume that there are a few things we do not need particular explanation. So there you are. We'll start with Peter Nagy. Peter. There. You want to sit there? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, I've just written down some notes to start our discussion. Well, we have three very separate sort of independent terms that I that I garner. Uh, what we are being asked to do is, is to uh, sketch out the relationship between the three or how the three affect each other or how the second and third affect the first. Um, when I'm talking, I think it's going to be always important to pull things back because, um, you know, context is everything and conditions for art and criticism in the market can be very different in very different places. So I think it's important that just for the sake of our conversation, um, we always uh, pull things back and, 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 and sort of remind ourselves that we're talking about what's going on in India today as opposed to other places, and so it can be, the differences can be so great. Um, but I think when we talk about the first term, art, the differences aren't so great, actually. Um, when now, and I would, what I would call, or others have called, the expanded field of art, and in many ways this is the triumph of the avant-garde, and we are, we are seeing its, uh, its penultimate um, success um, here. Perhaps maybe 20 years ago when I first came to India and started working here, um, there was still a difference, very much difference between the practices going on in India and in other parts of the world, um, especially in relation to the Western centers of you know, New York, London, Paris, those places. But now I think um, you know, everything is caught up and, and we can talk about the expanded field of art very much operating in India today too on an international globalized scale. Um, and this is wonderful for art, I think. Um, uh, I think we're at a point where uh, no matter what you think art could be, or you have an idea for art, um, it's boundless, it's limitless, and we can, if, we, if people try to come up with the most outlandish ideas of what a work of art could be from the audience, uh, we could probably come up with an artist actually doing that in the world today. Um, so everything can be art, everything is art. Um, it's a wonderful period for freedom, but I think also a very confusing time for artists because I think um, artists can um, misuse this freedom and it can be a very confusing field to move through. And myself, what I look for from artists now is actually how they um, negotiate that freedom through being uh, precise and being committed to either a material or a... Uh, a form of address or a specific medium or a type of imagery or something like that because I think um, for me the most important artists um, roll up their sleeves and make a very well, sometimes a lifelong commitment to a, to a specific set of parameters and really explore that very deeply and I think that's the artist role in society now they have that that almost that license to do that. In the same way I say a scientist would, would choose to, uh, you know, only uh, be on studying the quantum level, or say a microbiologist would choose just to spend his life studying, you know, the, the, the workings of the liver or something like that. I think that's what we need from artists now, that kind of specialization. I think artists um, shouldn't be um, chasing fashion every season. Um, I think also we're at a point now where art itself is a discourse that is, um, the function of art now is to problematize discourses, um, to expand definitions, and to value spaces of anxiety and uncertainty, and also the sp in between spaces, the interstitial spaces and the interstitial practices. We hear it all the time that art is about breaking down boundaries, and I think a lot of the 
most interesting, um, successful, even though that's a, that's a it's a very subjective term, how do we judge art being successful? But I think the best art certainly today, um, you know, operates on many different levels and surprises us by bringing together references from art, of course, the world of art, but moving into science, social practices, um, medicine, psychology, or, you know, perhaps overlapping with other fields of design and things like that. So that's when I talk about um, evaluating these interstitial spaces and practices. And also this, um, this great value of anxiety, of this, uh, this, this, we've seen contemporary art um, be championed for very much um, um, celebrating a, a confusion almost, and, and, and almost um, exploiting that, because all human beings go through that. And I think it's the artists, again, or the ones in society who get to really roll up their sleeves and make work from this and talk about this, where other people have to push that anxiety and uncertainty away to get the job done. Um, but it's very, you know, and that's a very valuable role in society, but it's also um, a hard thing for the people from outside of the art world to feel comfortable with. It's hard to feel comfortable with anxiety, right? <laughs> um, we're certainly in the society of the spectacle, and fine arts have joined into that spectacle. Uh, the German tabloid newspaper Bild recently reported on the opening of an art fair and saying, important art and even more important VIPs. Art has become the religion of high society. And this has been a very constant sort of um, uh, theme, I think, with um, contemporary art, in, especially in the West. Um, of the last, say, 20 to 30 years, that the museums are now the temples of culture and people go there. Um, which, when we bring it back to the local context, is a very, very different thing, and um, a, probably a, a, a subject for an entirely different panel. But I think here, um, it does reflect, a, uh, just to, to make a footnote, I think it does reflect on the market in India precisely because I think many people, the mindset in India, still attaches the fine arts very much to religion. Where um, in, in, in the West especially, you know, uh, it, it has, it's been championed as a very secular space. So that does, it, as we go down the line, does affect um, markets very much. Um, our second term is criticism. Almost as diverse as art, but not quite. Um, I think on one hand we have theory. Um, art theory, which I think can be its own work of art in right, and I think when we talk about criticism, we're talking about, you know, the writer actually giving their opinion on works of art or an exhibition, and we don't really expect theory to do that. Theory is something that I think that's more, um, you know, obviously more independent <coughs> of objects and make it, um, and almost as I said, a, a work of art, a work of philosophy in its own. But it is part of the cr the the. the parameters of criticism today, and we move from criticism to dialogue to reportage, because that's really, I, I mean, everyone complains about the newspapers here, yes, and if you compare it to Bollywood, I mean, there's nothing about fine art, but I think um, there's a good amount of reportage about uh, the fine art and exhibitions that are happening in the newspapers. Um, and page three celebrities come into that. And then we move into something like documentation. So where do we really position criticism along this trajectory if we go from theory to dialogue to reportage to documentation? I think it's safe to say that in India now, probably the most um, vital space is in dialogue, such as what we're doing today. Um, many events have um, talks attached to them, exhibitions have talks, and they're very, very well attended. So um, it speaks well of the audience's desire for dialogue about art, and criticism certainly comes into this. Um, and then um, what's interesting is I hear um, some friends who have galleries um, that are, very, are relatively young and doing quite interesting um, you know, experimental programming, they get a little frustrated that there's not more people coming to see it. And I often say, but you're not popular culture. You're fine art. Fine art is, by definition, um, I think it is elitist. Um, I always like the, the, to take the attitude that Philippe de Montebello had when he was the director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. He said, yes, the fine arts are elitist. Come join the elite. So. Um, you want you want mass mass adoration, go be involved. You know? um, and lastly, to the market, um, 
probably the slipperiest to all terms. Well, what really is the market? I mean, if we, we can't say it's just selling artworks. Um, certainly galleries are probably what comes to mind first. But when we talk about the art market today, especially for contemporary art, but not only for contemporary art, for all forms of art, um, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a wide parameter, and you have to include museums, biennials, art fairs, residencies, um, private collections, and auctions. All of, these, all of these matrices are parts of the puzzle that build the social construction of the art world, and it's a social construction which determines value of the objects, ultimately. Um, we sell artworks, hopefully, every day, not always, um, um, from the gallery, and it's still a bit of a, of a shadow puppet play about why this person is really buying this work of art. You never really know what puts them over the edge to say, this is the artist I want to spend money on, this is the work that I want to bring home and, and live with. Um, again, it's a very um, a complex interweaving um, um, a social construction uh, with many different forms of dependency and manipulation. And it may be that, yes, someone sees an exhibition in a gallery, and that's their first um, encounter with an artist, but then it may be they go to see a museum, show elsewhere, and then it's only when an auction, you know, something at auction goes up. But you're never really sure what is this combination of exhibitions. And again, the writing plays a very, very important part of this. Um, most writing today, as, as um, Ashok G said, uh, the galleries are producing catalogs and things, but museum catalogs, I would hesitate to call it criticism, because a lot, especially what galleries per, uh, produce tends to be Um uh, A gallery is not going to publish a derogatory article about the work that they're promoting, obviously. And museums don't tend to do that either, but maybe that's a space that could open up more. Um, uh, but this idea that um, you know people come to the gallery and the gallerist like hits them over the head with a club and they sign a check and walk out. I mean, it doesn't work that way. We wish it was that easy. Um, I don't think of myself um, as a gallerist. I don't feel like my main job is to sell art. I would say the role of a gallerist is is three parts, and one certainly is to sell the art, but the other one is to put on exhibitions, which is for me the most pleasurable part of it, and the third part is to represent the artist, because we're working every day for art for the artist that we represent, whether the exhibition is on or not. And you know, many times um, works of art sell many years um, after the you have exhibited them. So um, most of our work is um, not uh, only, but not even two thirds of our day is actually spent sort of handling the the matters of um, the exhibition on. Where, uh, where am I in terms of time? Am I good? Um, one more minute. <laughs> one more minute. Okay. Um, but in this sort of convoluted confluence of all these matrices that uh, that that are this social construction that somehow determines the value of um, art objects in for our society um, is how I would define the market. Um, what we're still seeing is that the museum exhibition is still the most prestigious event in the art system and carries the most long-lasting weight in terms of an artist market. We've seen it recently happen with um, you know, the Gaton de Show that's going to happen at the Guggenheim in New York in October. It hasn't even started yet, but already we're seeing the prices for Gaiton de go. Boop and Kakar will have a, a retrospective at Tate Modern. And so those with their ears to the ground, the collectors, things like that, the people in the market. I mean, these are extremely prestigious, very, very um, important events that codify the, the value, ultimately, of the work. And again, the value through not only the exhibition and the curating, but also the writers who are writing the catalogs and the, 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 the ancillary programming that all goes into it. Um, and, and so criticism plays an important part of that. Um, unfortunately, auctions have a very, um, in this uh, sort of Twitter culture where, where everybody wants everything really fast. I mean, you know, that auction blockbuster boom boom price like we just saw for the Adoni. Unfortunately, a lot of people pay attention to that. And there's a lot of bemoaning about the art space becoming this very fast space through the fairs, things like that. 
But you know, those of us who are here, I think we're all here because we're involved in art, and we still know that no matter where you go, you go to the Louvre, it's very easy to get away from the huge crowds of people going to the, see the Mona Lisa, and you can still find a wonderful little corner for yourself, virtually alone, with, with great masterpieces, which you can, and I still think that everyone involved in the art world still holds that slowness and that um, direct appreciation of real works of art, despite the JPEGs and everything else flying around. I mean, it all still is, it, I, you can't be cynical about it, because it all is still saying that, you know, the work of art, the original unique work of art, is the most valuable thing. Walter Benjamin has been proved wrong. Um, the, the age of mechanical reproduction has not destroyed the aura, which he says, he's, it's only increased the aura. I mean, if the Mona Lisa came up for sale, what would the value be? It's, it's, it's impossible to, to um, put a price tag on. Thank you. In India, an ad, a little one I share. We at the gallery are quite indebted to all of you for coming this part. And a lot of especially uh, because of this philanthropic that this is a symposium or this event is happening. I remember having lunch with him in Paris when he came up with this idea. That why don't we do a foundation and we we'll do A, B, C, D, E, F, and then I'll show you also there. And we became the so-called life members of the Purana Foundation. And it's all his donations which have made all this possible. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you all for coming. It's great to see a very packed house. Now, I read uh, somewhere, a very noted writer has said that we know the price of everything but value of nothing. Robert Hughes further adds that the only function art is reduced to is to sit on the wall and get more expensive. <laughs> I, I, I respect Robert Hughes a lot. I'm a fan of his. In fact, one of the first books I read was The Shock of the Dew by him. Now, I'd like to differ a little bit on this uh, prevailing thought that the greatest validity comes from the market. <clears throat> I'll just go back 20 years. And I used to visit Gaito very often. We became great friends with him. And that wasn't very easy because he was best left alone. And that I could frequent him regularly was a compliment by itself. <coughs> I remember his artist colleague saying that, Guy, can I join you for a walk? He said, provided you keep your mouth shut. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, Guy Tony was revered by art critics. Keith <coughs> Sen is there. And was revered by his peer group. Gaitonde, uh, is one of the greatest admirers of Gaitonde, and so are you. But he did not have the art market approval 20 years back as he has today. So therefore, the art writing or art assessment or critical assessment played a very, very vital role in Gaitonde's life. It is now that he's made $4 million that people are talking about his market. Otherwise, there was no market for him. And uh, uh, it was, I had a lot of gadgets in my gallery after the early 90s. In fact, I had a lot of players, I had a lot of Sousa. And nobody would say that, why would I get up early in the morning and look into a crooked face like that? So, those are the comments I used to hear in the early 90s. Now, this is despite no comprehensive book has been written on Guy Tondera. The other case in point is Nasreen Mahmoodi, who is purely popular because of critical assessment, 
critical variety and peer group approval. It's now that the museums have started to pay attention to her. My friend Masanori sent 21 <coughs> works to a Norwegian museum for a period of three months. It's been two and a half years he hasn't got his words back because they're traveling from one museum to the other, to the other, to the other, to the other. And Masanori is very happy because he admired earnestly. My colleague Sonia is there. Her works haven't come back in two years. Am I right, Sonia? There you go. <coughs> so, art market news has somehow replaced art criticism completely. If I go back to the 90s, I would look forward to Kek and I's article in the Sun Times on Sunday. Kesha Malik's article on the Times of India. He and Margot's article in Patriot. Paul's article in Statesman. It's now all re replaced by a million dollar painting sold. Because obviously that is more eye-catching than the critical assessment is. Now the recent, uh, he mentioned uh, Guy Tony's exhibition at Bogan Eye. Now is it because of the market? Or is it because of the critical assessment done uh, over a period of time? This may be a subject to debate and we can do that in Q&A later on. <coughs> Why is this happening? But obviously, now that that only is happening, other artists will follow, so I am told. Institute of Chicago is, as we speak, uh, exhibiting Neil Mache. So more and more Indian artists will be exhibited, and therefore they will get international audiences. <coughs> so Yadri Sena of the Dais is an art critic, art historian, curator, Peter Nagy, is an art critic, also is a gallerist and a curator. Now, in the absence of right entrepreneurship in art, we all develop as museums, galleries develop as museums, or we all do more than one thing, one discipline which we are supposed to do. That, that's fine. But the, it is the entrepreneurship which will then define people in their various slots. And that is at a dismal level today. Now that is where the state role in art as an activity, be it a gallery, be it a museum or a foundation promoting young artists, have been a little indifferent. Now the comparison between India and China is inevitable. In the year 2000, I recall, I think Rajiv was there in the Singapore auction. We were ahead of China in terms of sales in that particular auction. And we were very proud of ourselves and we said that we are ahead of China. Today, China, as we are told, is the largest art market in the world. They have built one museum per day in the last one year and have now have 3,500 museums in their country. In fact, in today's uh, New York Times, which we subscribe to online, MoMA gets 300,000, 3 million people every single year, which means that they get 10,000 people every single day. And that when New York has 10,000 museums. One museum for every 10,000 people. I don't know how many people go to National Museum and National Gallery combined. 500 maybe, optimistically speaking. So, I think uh, the state's role has got to be much, much greater than what it is today. I think most people in the audience would agree to that. In fact, China has given a 10-year tax holiday for every other activity be it a gallery, be it a museum, be it writing, be it creating everything in the tenure tax policy. Now, history is witnessed to the fact that civilizations are, are remembered by their art 
whether it's fine art, it is museum, it is poetry, it is writing, or any other activity, in the manner, manner the civilization is described. Now, I'm willing to go into all these details <coughs> if uh, you would like me to, but uh, this is the long and short of what I think of what is happening today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Then you're not just a market, you're something much, much more. And uh, Renu Modi, with whom I curated my first exhibition, Arun Vadera, with whom I curated my last exhibition, The Span. This is uh, perhaps the nature of dependencies. This is the nature of the relationship that the critic starts to enjoy with the larger art fraternity. And the fact that there is, as you said, this multiplicity of roles. I have a few things to say about art criticism. You know, the framing of the talk is such that it seems to put the market and the critic in some sort of a binary of oppositions. Are the critic and the market in a relationship of comfort? For a domain like art criticism, which is more or less deleted from the art space, do we have a clear sense of what the market has done for art criticism? Has it been good? Bad? Has it been the last nail in the coffin? Or has it been the most valiant support? And as the term theorist, I mean, are how many writers on art are still called critics? They're called cultural theorists, they're called curator and theorists. So even will the term art critic survive or criticism survive as we go forward? We've had two very eloquent speakers from the market. But I think there are one or two narratives about criticism that I would like to unpack and perhaps push the time frame a little further. I worked uh, with the Express, the Telegraph, and the Hindu till 2006. And as a critic and curator from the mid-90s when I curated my first exhibition in 1997. Now, by, by 2006, there was blood on the streets as far as art criticism was concerned. This had been demolished. It had been rendered defunct. Big business houses, when we talk about the market, what is the role of big business? Big business had withdrawn its support, and they were giving you know, a space to what they call the F stories, mainly fashion, food, etc. Most art columns, art editors had been rendered defunct. I think Art India was the only major publication at that time which survived. And of course, you know, look at, I mean, if you count the requiem, uh, certainly the art pages of the page of the pioneer, Kalidas was editor and it was an excellent page. The art pages of Economic Times, and again, um, rendered absolutely dead and void. But Art India, excellent perhaps, good writer, but comes out once in three months. Does it pay, play the function of reviewing? And at this time, in the mid-2000s, we see the spectacular rise of the art market. In a sense, this threatens this 100-year-old discipline of art writing. <coughs> now, let's. what was the critic? Is it just the media critic that we think we are talking about? The media critic becomes established in India around the early 1900s. This is in metropolitan newspapers like the Times of India. But also, you know, India has a very long and a very noble <coughs> tradition of the artist ideologue as critic. And in fact, some of the most um, dynamic states, some of the most dynamic pressure has come in terms of the movement of art from the artist as critic. And this stretches in an arc, I would say, from Abhinindranath to J. Swaminathan to G.M. Sheikh to K.G. Subramanian, where the artist has deliberately intervened in critiquing his own colleagues, his own forebears, and certainly critiquing art institutions. There was also the contemporary phenomenon now of the critic curator who doubles up as critic biographer. Uh, Vadera Gallery, Renu Modi, etc. support uh, the critic as biographer very uh, valiantly. <coughs> so let's plot an art food chain. The artist, on the level of the street, the artist and the gallery, a little higher in terms of what we can call the sifting would come the curator and the critic, and finally at the apex, as Mr. Vadera said, the museum and the historian. But in this chain, the weakest link has proved to be the critic. And his demise has been announced at seminars across the globe. So if we have to talk about the demise of the art critic, is it only the media critic, but is it also the larger space of the artist as critic, the academic critic? What is this demise? And the loss of the polemics, the loss of ideology. I agree, critical writing is deeply dependent on the economies of the state and the market. There is no critical writing without the solid support base. And the Indian arts critic space has actually lain between this triumphalism of the national institutions, the Lalit Kala, the NGM, etc., and you know, big business led by which leads media 
its very uncommitted positions, and since the early 2000s, the space of the gallery. We would like, we can argue that the market would like to appropriate, but has challenged the institution and mediatic structures as we know them. And I think the critic today, or the writer on art, can only be successful if you can negotiate both these power structures, the patronage of the, uh, patronage of the art institution and the patronage of the gallery successfully. So let's consider two, if I have the time, let's consider two, two critics. I'm pushing this further beyond Geeta Kapoor and Nasir Mohammadi to see what happened in this 100-year di discipline. If criticism comes to India in 1900 with the Times of India, what did we throw up? You can take Rabindranath and his uh, sort of messianic influence, but take a sharper example, and that is Abhinindranath. We, you know, under the fuzzy glow and the soft edges of the Bengal school, there was a very uh, cogent and well-formed practice. Abhinindranath launches the Bichitra Club. The Bichitra Club creates a space for printing, for uh, performance, uh, for a whole dynamic slew of activities. And the Indian Society for Oriental Art, which the Lalit Kala has been funding until quite recently, then becomes the organ for the dissemination of ideas. Art writing becomes intrinsic to Abhinindranath. And with the Pichitra Club, we see printing, music, <coughs> performance, shooting out. Also, Abhinindranath becomes a patron. This is, I think, very important, and this is certainly in the context of the Raza Foundation. Because the Tagore family directly funds the club. The, fu the club becomes a sort of a residency for Japanese artists. It, when uh, Nandalal is going through a very impecunious time and cannot afford uh, daily survival, the Vichitra Club buys out his paintings. And in his essays on art, Abhinindranath invokes art history. And this is a model that we see very successfully used by K.G. Subramanian later and Ghulam Muhammad Sheikh. It's a spectacular model. Writers, critics, scholars surround Abhinindranath. They see him as the great artist critic of his time. So you see, I mean, even the society, Indian Society for Oriental Art describes him as an artist and a critic. His student, Pinot Behari, says he's the greatest <coughs> nationalist art critic of all time. And he says, you know, the sarcasm of the English language press, etc., is countered. And if it is countered, it is only by Abhinindranath Tagore as a writer. So this model actually, I think, demonstrates what could be seen in our times as the beginning of the artist collective. The artist and a group of like-minded people, scholars, critics, writers, a conglomeration of shared ideals, and this fanning out of a group. As we know, Abhinindranath's students shoot out all over India. It's like a fruit, and the seeds burst, and they go, K. Venkatappa, B. P. Roy Chaudhary, etc., etc., the Ukil brothers who come to Delhi, and the germination of the idea of the pedagogy. And of course, then what follows? K.C. Aspanikar, Madras Art College, K.G. Subramanian, and his own alter ego, Muchi. These are all writers and very influential artists. And the way they formulate what should be art. K.G.'s very strong influence in Baroda and Shanti Nikitin. Swaminathan and his writing in Link, where he debunks the sentimentalism of the Bengal school. And in Swami's view, the art critic was a figure to be debunked. He says these are peripheral pen pushers of the newspaper world who brings the attitude of the flunky to art appreciation, unquote. But then there is the mantle of the critic, which Swaminathan himself assumes. And then Gulab Sheikh, Gupin Hakkar, and Jogin Chaudhary themselves. I remember in 1994, Giti Sen will recall, we had the first art critics forum over here in the IIC. And we had uh, Jogin Chaudhary, etc., saying we don't need the art critic. Some of the most dynamic formulation has actually come from the artist. <coughs> So the artist as critic was voluble, he was passionate. He also approximated what the critic has struggled for, and this is the high moral ground, you know. These are extra artistic goals, the goals of nationalism, aesthetic values, Indianness, indigenism, secularism, and protest. So when we come to say Vivan Sundaram or Ram Rahman in Sehmat, working on the notion of <coughs> the artist as, you know, uh, the um, sort of the custodian of moral value, this is what we receive. And then we have also Rux Media Collective, the artist as the finest interpreter of their own mediatic practice. So when we evacuate the space of the critic, what happens then to the artist critic is a moot point, and I leave it to the audience to decide. There's also the model of the media critic. When some of the most savvy um, critics today are those which, who can actually negotiate this. Uh, I want to take one critic as an example, and that is Richard Bartholomew. I think he deserves serious study. Because he seems to be the earliest example of being able to work with a private gallery and a newspaper and the Lalit Kala, sometimes at the same time. 
we simply don't have such an example in our time. So Kunika Kemal Gallery 60 to 62, Indian Express 58 to 62, Thought 55 to 60, Times of India 62 to 80. It's a huge span of activity. You know, it's like a career which is like water between the rocks. But he was able to do this very successfully and in a way, one can say, he anticipates the critic the curator <laughs> of the time. And the great thing about, you know, you've talked about the sympathetic relationship of the moderns. And this is Richard, uh, I think, played a hand in this. So when he dies, Hussein makes this glowing epitaph for Richard, the poet, uh, the painter, the photographer, the art critic, and above all, the true friend of all artists. All critics are not so lucky. They're not always considered the true friend of all artists because they demolish reputation. <coughs> they pull down reputations. They can ignore careers. They can drive up markets. They can drive down markets. They are famous examples. Where one critic actually, you know, jhanda gados and stands by an artist and creates an enormous defense. O.C. Ganguly, Gaganindra Natagar, Stella Kramrish and her support for Suneni Devi. Karl Khandalawala, Charles Fabri, Yashodra Dalmia and Amrita Shergi. Rudy von Leiden's attack on the Bengal artists, <coughs> especially Ram Pinkar. And his then his great support for the progressives. Trishan Khanna, Tayyab Mehta and Raza Saab, of course. Joseph James on South Indian sculpture. Richard Bartholomew and his beautiful serendipitous writing on Ram Kumar. And in the last two decades, this case, which has just come up, which is an important one of a critic standing by an artist, and that would be Gita Kapoor with Nasreen Mohammed. <coughs> so when we look back at, say, the 90s and the early 2000s, what was the image of the art critic? My memory is of Shanto Dutta seeing an exhibition in the evening, rushing to the Indian Express, manual typewriter banging out his review so that the review came out the next morning. And you'd have the boy literally, you know, take, rush with the thing, get it printed. The next morning, the city woke up to an opinion. The show had been trashed, it had been damned with faint praise, it had been ignored, or it had been praised. But today, the critic has, is absolutely caught in a bind. And as Peter mentioned, this is the bind of what we call theory, aesthetics, art history. <laughs> Uh, and opinion formation through curatorial writing. So by mutating into the critic curator, we have, in a certain sense, evacuated this space ourselves. This is something that's important. The, as you rightly said, that the gallery's writing on art is not serious criticism. <laughs> 20 years from now, you will probably have still have warehouses full of glossy catalogs, which don't have ISBN numbers, which are not in the public domain, seriously speaking, and which are not going to be consumed. The other thing which is a great irritant to a critic is the glossy auction catalog, where you know uh, writing from a critic is lifted to sort of sell a work of art. But there's no real acknowledgement, there's no dialogue with the critic, and this is what the auction house does. So if criticism is in a state of decay, if we don't have a critic any longer, we don't have reviews, we don't have this energetic writing every night, should we try to resuscitate it? Should we just let it go? I think there's a huge loss over here. In India, where the roots of contemporary art don't lie in philosophy and aesthetics, this is not Europe. We're not coming down from Kant and Hegel. We come from the disciplines of politics. We come from the di discipline or the observation of urbanism. It's very evident in the work of Raza and Krishan Khanna, for instance. And I think critics were some of the keenest interpreters of our time. To lose this space, in a certain sense, is to lose our keenest interlocutor. And I'm not quite sure about what the answer is. Perhaps the answer lies in the market, or perhaps it lies in us, as we who are the critics, and to see whether we can renegotiate re this space into a space not of just reviewing or criticism, but into a space of knowledge creation. Thank you. Thank you very much. My friends, you have heard three very interesting, illuminating presentations from the three panelists. Uh, do they have to ask each other anything? Or we, no. Uh, no, 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 I'd like to uh, just ask Kaiji perhaps for just a question. Um, two things were perhaps with the, rot, the the diminishment of the newspaper, the printed critic, I mean, uh, maybe that is part and parcel because of the rise of the internet and because the blogosphere and all that. I'm, I'm not that attached to it or, or, or involved with it at all, but it may, is there some balancing that's gone on, at least because that dialogue, that criticism, the voice of the writer has moved on to cyberspace and is active there. 
I'm surprised also when you say that the critic who has to become the curator, the critic slash curator, vacates that space of criticism by when they enter that space of curatorial practice. Because for me, that is actually the real substance. You're rolling up your sleeves. You're not just sitting in your drawing room spouting, you know, uh, uh, pronouncements about a show that somebody else is. You're rolling up your sleeves, you're diving into the material, you're putting on a real exhibition, and, and putting yourself on the line by choosing artists, by choosing artworks, because for me, it's always going to come back to the material objects in the exhibition. So I would just argue that you're not vacating that space of criticism. No, 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 no. You're, actually, you're actually enlivening it. No, no, no. You're, you're, you're let, me jumping. Be, let me be clear about this. You vacate the space of the newspaper columns because then there is a conflict of interest. I can't critique oh. your show and his show and then curate my own show and think, you know, this is a very fair thing. Did someone ask you to do that? Uh, no, this is my own conscience. My oh, conscience asked aspect. me to. Yeah, okay. But uh, Peter, there's, this, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a sense of the critic and criticism and the reviewing, but there's a space of criticality. You don't abandon the space of criticality. No. So this is what you work with, and you are the critic curator. There is very much the notion of uh, precisely the tools that you want to engage with, whether they're sociological or historical, and that's what you bring to your concept. And you engage with that through your text, but as you rightly said, that the curator is not going to smash somebody or bop him on the head, because that is the artist that he's included in the exhibition. And once you abandon the newspaper column, then that space is a vacated space. It's, it's not because I vacated it, that's the newspaper also expelled virtually everybody from about the mid-2000s. You don't have newspaper re reviews any longer. This is a, this is a very big uh, the, the newspaper reviews were extremely independent of uh, what exhibitions each gallery was doing. So if Kate and I were reviewing, let's say, in Hindustan Times, he would have seven to eight reviews and that would cover nearly half a page. And it would be irrespective of his relationship with the gallery. So the reader would then decide that which gallery or which artist does he like amongst the six, seven. Similar thing would happen to a half a page in Times of India by Keshav Malik who writes six to seven reviews. All the exhibitions happening in the and then P. N. Margot writing, then call writing. So there was a fair amount of material available to the general audience that this is what is happening in the city. Choose whatever you want to choose. You're also exceptional because you're the only gallerist who was writing on his own artists. And that then then that, that becomes a sort of that becomes the space of the outside writer because that objectivity which a writer should bring to the artist. What, how do you feel about that? Because when you stop writing, who writes on them? You continue commissioning the catalogs, etc. What is your position on that? That's interesting. You know, I'm interested to know why does a gallery sometimes carry a catalog, sometimes not carry a catalog? An exhibition which doesn't have a catalog hasn't happened. It's distributed. It's ephemeral. It's gone. It's there's no record. And it's a, it's, it's well, something we, to think we about. We have documentation on the website that is there. I mean, <laughs> with 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 backup with reviews in the newspapers. And put, I mean. I mean, there's only so much we can do. We can't. Yeah. And and I recently said to, there was uh, uh, someone writing about this space, and I think because we're able to do it through the PDF now, we're able to make that small scale catalog that reproduces all the works in the show to send out to people. So I think most of the galleries, um, ourselves included here, are trying to put together larger books, which simply cover a larger span of the artist's practice, more shows, more works, and have a much longer shelf life. So they're much more useful to everybody is what we're trying to concentrate on, but that's also a larger production and even much larger budget. But for me, I think criticism also was always about a peer group, right? I think any any generation of artists or, or gallerists or critics come up with it, and, and that space of you know, going to see a film or going to see, uh, going to an art opening and then going out to dinner with, with, a, with a group of peers, and you discuss it, um, seems to me that has moved on to, on to the, the web. Um, I'm not on Facebook, but I hear that from, from friends that are on Facebook, they're saying, oh, we're hearing good things about that show from Facebook, that there is that dialogue going on with a peer group discussing exhibitions that they've seen. Yeah. But, but you think that's not... But it's not, it's not serious criticism. It's like, great show, catch it. Oh. <laughs> I don't think I could get by an Indian exhibition. 
Okay, well maybe I'll just thought it was a little more serious. I thought it was a little more in depth. Well, yes? Yeah. Uh, this is a, a subject which needs to be needs, needs to be elaborated, but I will, I will be brief. Uh, what Peter Nagy said uh, that the criticism has moved on to the blogosphere. Actually, that is very right. Uh, it is not in Facebook what is happening as uh, eye-catching things. Blogosphere has taken over. And the people who have guts, they write. And if there is an opinion by expressed by a critic, whether he is qualified or she is qualified or not, if there is an opinion, people do read. And uh, now, uh, this is just a uh, general uh, observation. Now I just want to ask a question to all these uh, three eminent panelists. Uh, <clears throat> like I passed out from MS University Baroda uh, in 1995, it is almost uh, 15 years, I know, 20 years now. I have been practicing since then. I have uh, 25 years of writing career behind me. So suppose from all the institutions in India, if we take last 20 years and every year, if 10 Art history, art criticism, postgraduates are coming out, including the, 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 the prestigious Jawaharlal Nehru University Arts and Aesthetics Department. Then there should be at least 600 people, 600 art historians and critics in this country. Where these people have gone? And I have the answer. I have written it also. Like I think most of the people must be knowing in the art scene, like, uh, you know, what uh, my opinion is. Uh, by the way, for the audience sake, I am Johnny Emil. I'm, a, I'm an art critic, you know, I mean, that's a material anyway. So I just want to, uh, you know, ask senior gallerists like uh, Mr. Arun Vandira, Peter Nagy, where these people have gone? Haven't you contributed to the decimation of these uh, possible potential art critics into backroom officers, backroom executives in the gallery? People that have been working with us for, for a while had to leave the jobs for various reasons and we did put out on Facebook a call that we're looking for and I'm shocked how few people have come in for these positions that we're looking for, for to fill and it's, I, I mean, what's, it's shocking, um, what's all, I'm, I don't know, I don't know where they went, I, it's a good question. <laughs> no, I think you know what he's talking about is uh, of a very serious concern to us as a country, as a board. If you take 5,000 students passing out of a fine art program, you're talking about six students passing out of a no, art history, 10 students passing out of an art history program. So look at the amount of people, or look at the number of unemployed people we are developing in this country just because of lack of entrepreneurship within the country. The art market is pretty much confined to Delhi and Bombay. Do you have better appreciation of art in Calcutta? There is no market, so therefore, you know, how do you hire a critic or how do you hire somebody to write your catalog? So it's a chicken and egg story. That, you know, the prosperity of the market has to come for people, uh, for 10 or 60 of them to get employed. We as a gallery get hundreds of applications on a monthly basis. And mind you, they are great artists around them. We can't accommodate them because we don't have the space to do it. Although we are a very large setup, we've got 40 people working together, but still we don't have the space to do it. We can do only so much. I think, you know, when I gave an example of 10,000 museums in New York City itself, we need to do something to get our entrepreneurship up. Um, I I agree with uh, you, uh, Johnny Emil. I think you're right. I'm not sure that everybody aspires to the market situation in terms of jobs. I think state institutions, we should ask ourselves when uh, NGMA made an open call for curators, how many people joined? What is very few? And because the, the, there have to be uh, adequate conditions for... <coughs> Um, but uh, I, I also agree that the blogosphere is the sphere for criticism. I'm setting up my own website and I'm hiring one or two people. If you know any really good art historians, please recommend them to me. I'd be very happy. I think you should help. <laughs> yes? Uh, Anybody else? Well, I just like really speak from my own personal experience as a member of, uh, of a number of artists at one, one particular moment in time as it was. 
the strange thing there was, there was a, a great deal of critical talk amongst each one of us. And not only was there critical talk, there was critical writing, which also happened. Um, and th this does exist today as a probably a historical <laughs> monument. I don't know what, what possible uh, effect it might have on other painters or whatever. But it certainly uh, grappled with the whole question of painting and the relevance of our type of painting to the situation that we were placed in. I think about Gaithoni, something was said, and I knew Gaithoni extremely well. Um, Gaithoni did not have a great fan following. And he was very aware of it and was very independent. He didn't care whether he did or he didn't. You know. um, the strange thing which happens is the, shall we say, the privilege of death. You pass out and you suddenly become famous. You know, you suddenly, <laughs> people's eyes open up and they start grappling, they collecting their works and the Guggenheim comes in and Guggenheim makes an art. I mean, Guggenheim, no, no institution ever made an artist in, yes, it does, you know, temporarily, I suppose. I mean, in a social kind of a sense, yes, it, it does function. But the work happened quite independent of this activity. And that, I think, will go, goes on. Because I think, certainly, if any art is concerned, and I am not concerned with, you know, with my generation or any, any artist who is madly fond of what he's doing is investigating quite honestly and truly, he's going to leave behind a legacy which is going to be taken note of. I think that actually is a fact. It's proved so. Even in our lifetimes, it's been proven. It happened with Tariya Mehta. Only the last four years, just four and a half years, did he at all manage to sell anything like Which he didn't, didn't, see, didn't see. Huh? He did not see it in his life. He did not. I know he didn't. And believe you me, the whole group, like people like Al Ghazi, all of us, <coughs> we put our all into it to make him a possibility. He, he, be, he became, he became poss the possibility made him uh, float. I won't say make him, but it managed for him to survive. And this survival, this whole act of survival, existed not only with Tayyip but several others, Gaitoni included. But all together, Gaitoni and Tayyip, for, for that matter, both of you sitting here. I had a terrible time. No, but both of you sitting here, and Hussein and Ramkhan. Yes, yes. But they was in. None of us have had a So they, they were was an amazing the amount of respect for each other. Huh? There was an amazing amount of respect for each other. An amazing amount. Not only, not only was it respect, uh, it was actually a question of helping out financially as well. As also, you know, there was a point where Hussein and I would go to Nizamuddin for chai and that roti. Mm -hmm. And since I knew Gaitoje better, yeah. a little better, not that he was knew Gaitoje very, very no, no, well, no, no. but he said, he said, the whole of New York right up and down and so on without without saying a word to each other. Hmm? But it doesn't mean there wasn't any communication. We were communicating the whole time. And then in the evening, you know, he'd go off to his own room and I'd remind in Chelsea and say, okay, we meet for a drink. And then once we had had a drink, then a lot would come out. <laughs> There's an appropriate time for talking. Another thing that I wanted to point out is about, uh, which flows from what Krishna was saying just now, these artists were also writing to each other. Yes. He had published two books from the Raza Foundation, funded by Vadera Art Gallery. One, a correspondence between Raza and Krishan Khanna, and other correspondence between Raza and other members of the uh, Progressive Artist Group. They wrote to each other. They defended each other. They criticized each other. Yes. There's a letter uh, Hussein reacted <coughs> adversely to a drawing that Tayyab had sent to him. And Tayyab 
uh, tries to sort of defend that. And in the entire process, if someone were to read it critically and rigorously, several, uh, a kind of a poetics could possibly be made out by the artists themselves. And as you were saying, that there was a time when Avril Tagore had that, and of course some other people had it. There was this group also which had this. Because they were writing to each other, not merely. Sometimes, of course, they are writing. You know, the five pounds that you gave to me, you lent to me. I am returning soon, etc. That is the state of affairs financially. But they are also discussing. I think there is a rich. I don't know whether now that kind of a correspondence, that kind of a uh, intellectual and, and aesthetic. Uh, exchange between artistic, I mean, if it takes place, at least it has not yet come into the public domain. And it's only just from but it's, uh, somebody, somebody wanted to say, uh, yeah, sure, please. Huh? Sure. I just want to say one thing. That it wasn't all fancy fancy. We were great friends. Yeah, of course. But it, it, there was some very critical speaking which was also done in Paul's apartment. Almost, you know, like uh, Goswami on the television. <laughs> How did we all at each other? The streets were falling. You know, there was great, great, great deal of passion and respect about what one was doing. And we also knew that each one was a separate entity on going their own ways. And they did. The one coherence of this group. There was no. Huh? You're saying there wasn't any. Other than you were all in the same place no, at the same other, time. Yeah, other than, other than in a philosophic sense. Oh. There was no restriction, which was being a great deal was being held uh, important. In serious art. Uh, yes. <laughs> what 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 about uh, 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 sound? <coughs> what about uh, uh, music? What about dance? Theatre. Same thing is happening over there as well. You don't find that kind of criticism or that kind of critics anymore what we used to have earlier, and, and that was contemporary with, uh, with, with that kind of art uh, criticism. Now, has it got something to do with the lack of leisure now, yeah. with shrinking of space where you could meet, congregate, and discuss things? Now, today we are concerned with Twitter, with SMSs, and headline news. So, so has it got something to do with that, that commerce has taken over and we are always in a rush? <laughs> the West and their art criticism have not exactly died. The number of books I go to MoMA or some other places, the number of books I want to buy, which has just come out, is so large. No, but since how, how visually literate are we as a, as, a, as, a, as a people? How visually literate are we? Well, that's of course a larger question. How literate visually we are. We can have a panel discussion on that. But there was, yes. Okay. I, I correct uh, Listening to Gayatri's uh, anecdotes about uh, artists uh, back 100 years ago who also doubled as critics uh, or back and forth, and even among the progressives, uh, some of them did that. It seemed to me that one reason why they probably did that was because. A, they had a lot of time on their hands. They had very little of a market to sell. And B, they had very little money. So, you know, they were moonlighting, depending on which was their principal activity and which was their secondary activity. But this is not to make light of it, but simply to sort of point out what might have been a, a reality for them. And the reason I bring that up is, unfortunately, when we look at the state of, of play in India, uh, we Indians are visually illiterate, uh, so we don't need really to have a seminar on this. You know, unfortunately, that's the case, and the state is not going to help. Uh, so, so the state of play really is that you folks and the art critics have to educate the Indian elites because they're the ones who have the money and potentially the will to, you know, to cause the top-down phenomenon to happen whereby you can educate a whole population on the importance of, uh, of the art, of the visual arts. But you have to start with the elite. So, so one response that I would have to Gayatri is, um, you know, maybe you guys are uh, 
quote unquote a dying breed because you have not uh, moved with the times and become more commercial than you should be. Maybe you're talking to each other instead of talking to collectors. Um, you know, maybe there is, needs to be an easier way for you to say to yourself, you know, just as, uh, as Peter and, and Arun are, um, you know, are straddling both criticism and, uh, and dealing, that art critics have to become much more, not just much more commercial oriented, but address themselves to the most important uh, commercial entities in India. She does. I do. <laughs> I'm addressing myself to commercial entities. She, she does. But I think what we've done uh, is what Peter pointed out is to actually move into the space of conversation. So we've done that and uh, there is this small entity called Critical Connected, but there are many, many others like me. Where we do, uh, where if a museum approaches you or a set of collectors or a gallery approaches you, you do set up a talk program. So we did it for the Kochi Biennial, we've done it for the Kiranada Museum. We get a pretty good audience, and um, specifically addressing collectors, I mean, if somebody sets it up, I imagine, but it should be a serious activity. But ideally, what about the great publics? You never know who's going to spring up from the publics. More writers, more filmmakers. Art is not only about art, it's about so many multiple disciplines. And I think the fact that you should be able to have these terms of address. I'm actually very encouraged by the fact that now, Delhi and CR is now the home of something like seven major uh, universities of the humanities. It's an extraordinary thing. I mean, you have great uh, writing in the United States, but if you look at, say, England, the space for the humanities is shrinking. Money is being taken out of universities. Here in India, it's been poured in. But then where's the publication? What's going to support, what's going to support the critical requirement if it's not people like us? Of course, we're hugely in demand. We just have to find the right connect. At the same time, Dr. Arindhati Roy was writing about that particular uh, Ambedkar's uh, Lahore uh, speech or Lahore booklet. In that, there is a small uh, sentence that a priest cannot be revolutionary. Or if he is a revolutionary, he cannot be a priest. Similarly, if an art critic is compromising with the institution or the commercial interest, then he cannot or she cannot be an art critic. Because the, the, where the criticism goes. Pablo Helguera is a Mexican artist living in New York. He has written a book called uh, Surviving, A Manual for Surviving in Contemporary Art. That's a wonderful thing. Everyone should read. Then the, 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 the problems are sorted, I should read. <laughs> is there anybody else who wants to say something? Oh, yes. Maybe here. Yeah. I'm an artist and I've also studied history of art. So, my observation uh, from artist's point of view is that one reason why the dialogue between the critic and the artist is not happening informally or formally is the language art criticism has adopted in contemporary times. Like many artists, they feel um, a complex when the present critics, they come out of those art colleges and they speak that particular kind of jargon based <laughs> Which is a kind of an opposite. And I'm not um, like trying to uh, make fun of it, but I'm just mentioning that it has actually created a barrier between the critic and the artist. So if the artist talks uh, very simply or directly, the critic is coming with a heavy dose language. And that becomes the barrier. That terminology. No, you, 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 you say they're not talking because there is a language gap. Contemporary art theory is so heavy dose. Yeah. Yeah. I think you know she is right yeah. because critics do some sound regulars tend to be a little too pedantic and uh, a language which a normal person can't understand. <laughs> but no, but this, this language that we are talking about was never the language of the mainstream media. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's a, special, it's a specialist language. It's a specialist language, <laughs> language which had very little to do with the market or the, well. yeah. or the general public. As your article I can understand very well. Thank you. No, but this, yeah, what I'm hearing is always this, this thought right. that the language has to come into the popular realm. Why? Why can't it be a specialized language? Like quantum theory is a specialized language. And you can, you can argue that the artists, many of these artists are making things that people can't relate to because they don't understand the language because the artists have studied these things for eight years in college, then they go get a PhD in London, and they come back and people are dumbfounded by what they're doing. <laughs> but you say that the artists, they shouldn't do that? 
It's a highly specialized language. Let the artist flourish in the specialized space. Why are we always trying to pull it down into the popular for some reason? I'm, let's, let's maintain, let's say it's fine art and damn the public. <laughs> In that time you learned some Sanskrit. <laughs> yes, please. Just a minute. We take the mic. Huh. Yes, there it is. Please. Yeah, I think the problem is in trying to think that there is one space which everybody has to occupy simultaneously. Yeah. 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 That is a mistake. Yeah. I think that there is there is a level at which a particular discourse carries on, and people who are interested in that particular discourse will participate in that discourse at that level. Uh, I have seen this. It is a real problem. You have a filmmaker who doesn't know how to talk beyond his or her own work. Yeah. And you cannot expect that filmmaker to participate in a discussion in which there is a film theoretician sitting there also because there are because there are complete disparity. So you can't really make a demand that either the filmmaker becomes theoretically sound or not make a film or a particular <coughs> theoretician, okay, so in a sense top down. There are different discourses as Peter is pointing out and we have to allow each of them to survive in their own space. In the same manner in which, I mean if it's all going to be about how much we can understand, then everything comes down to the minimum that is the most popular. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then actually there is no point in talking about art as a separate entity altogether. So the fact that you talk about something which has an exclusive space, which is something that has to be worked upon much more deeply, I mean the examples that Peter's giving of quantum physics or whatever, that's when the thing you have to allow it to have its own space. You cannot want to put everything into the Bombay model. It is not, it's not going to work. You have to let it be, you have to let corners exist, and you have to let each of these spaces, there are blogs, there are blogs. The problem with blogs is they're not as well known as Gayatri's columns, okay? So what? They're known by 100 people who read them, and they read them very, very, very seriously. Okay, but there are, okay, we can say that the information that used to come from those kind of pages is not coming any longer. I would say that, okay, for instance, the kind of uh, art pages that the Economic Times ran under uh, Vikram Sundarji first, and then later under Southern and then, were incredible, were incredible. I mean, you know, basically you had almost on a daily basis a huge page in an Economic Times, economic newspaper. Yeah. Uh, um, um, monetary newspaper, finance newspaper, devoted to art. And that covered the daily scene, the Bombay scene, incredibly. That's gone. It's gone because <coughs> most of the uh, newspapers won't want it any longer. They don't see a value in it. It'll probably come back. I think once we have a slightly more literate, more visually literate uh, the population, it'll probably come back. Because they will ultimately want to reach out to those who can access that newspaper. And that seems like a uh, this is addressed to Gayatri, but it's addressed to the whole panel. Um, I, I really think that as a writer and critic, I am completely in agreement with Gayatri. And I think the point somewhere, is this, uh, the question that came up has been lost. I think it's a matter of the word, isn't it? It's a matter not of a blog or not a matter of uh, a PDF file, but it's a question of how you refine a paragraph, how you define a sentence, how you, how you play with words. And Keshav Malik certainly did that, but many others, Richard certainly. Um, I, I think that the writer poet and the writer uh, is a very important entity, which guides you made a very, very strong and passionate plea for. And um, the writer doesn't stand alone. I mean, the writer needs a readership. The writer also needs patronage, just as much as the artist does. And uh, let's remember that it is, in many ways, the writers who have made generations of artists. You may say that it is a collusion between the gallery, the artist, the gallery, the market. But the writer played an important role for a long time. And I, I, don't, I don't think we have to lament the death of the writer. I think we just have to look at what, what can we do about it. I mean, if, if, you want, if you want to say that there's no time to read, then I think we're losing a very important element of, of what constitutes art, what constitutes writing. So I, I really do think it is up to the galleries, it is up to the market uh, to also consider that something has to be done about good writing or bad writing. But you know, I mean, there has to be writing because everything else except in the art world, the art itself and the writing 
passes on with the writing stays. And we have Amal Alana sitting there, Mr. Al Qazi's catalogs are very important. And we have the Dera's books, they're very important. They're there. They're there because, I mean, they'll be there 100 years later. So I, th I think that it's very important to understand that this, this is something that not the writer could do alone. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you want to say something? Yeah. No, I just wanted to say that I was thinking about Shamla, actually, since you're talking yeah. about newspapers and writing and so on that Shamlal was a person who was a closely in touch with artists and he wrote quite a lot uh, in the papers as well as in cat books and whatever. I mean, I think he was about the first writer on Rachel there. But he was also the figure of the editor as critic. That's right. As, a, as an editor, he was an extremely literary man. And the other guy was A.S. Raman, Raman, editor of the Illustrated Weekly. Yes, and yes, yes. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we, yes, we come to the end of the evening. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. We'll take a break for two months. Hopefully you'll also not be here. So uh, after two months, we'll resume Art Matters and we'll inform you in good time. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Really? <laughs> 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 <laughs>